If you have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to open up with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verse 18 through chapter 16, verse 4. So John chapter 15, beginning in verse 18, and then going into chapter 16 up until verse 4. I'm going to be reading out of the English Standard Version. I encourage you to have a copy of God's Word open so that you can see God's Word as we work through this text together. I will read and then pray for us. This is God's Word for us this evening. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause." But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. They will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. This is God's Word. Would you join me now in prayer as we ask for our Heavenly Father's help as we come to His Word. God, we thank You for the privilege that it is to gather. That the church is not something that we watch on a screen primarily. It's not something that we go to as a building, but rather it's a body to whom we belong. God, what a joy it is to be with your church this night. God, we pray as we draw near to your word, would you speak to us? God, we pray open our eyes to see all that you have for us. May the Spirit illuminate the text of Scripture before us, that it would reach deep into our hearts, that it would be planted in hearts that are fertile soil so that it might dwell in us richly. We pray, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. Give us a tenderness to be able to respond to all that you have for us in the Word. And we pray in doing so that Christ would be made much in this place, that he would be magnified in our lives, in our homes, in our families. Our joy in him would be made full, that he would be our greatest treasure in this life. We ask this in his name. Amen and amen. Have you ever been in a situation where you began a project? Maybe it was a home renovation for our students. Perhaps it was a school project or a paper. Have you ever been in a situation where you began a project and about halfway through you realized this is going to be way more costly than you thought originally? That this is going to be way harder than you originally thought it would be? All of a sudden your estimations were found out to be false And this is a a lot more difficult than you had anticipated. Every single one of us have been in that situation. And it should not shock us then to realize that Christians often find themselves in a very similar position when it comes to their faith. Oftentimes Christians can get into the Christian life. We hear the message of the Gospel. God gives us a new heart by the work of His Spirit and His grace. And we see Christ for the first time as glorious and loving and merciful and righteous and holy. And we place our trust in Him. And we go on in this sense of joy and happiness and peace and patience. And yet, there is almost this naive notion early on that we think life is just going to be smooth sailings for the rest of time. Well, it doesn't take long for Christians to realize about several months and years into the Christian faith that this is going to be a lot harder 
than we originally anticipated to. In fact, we can look all throughout our world and we can see situations where Christians have a very hard time in life. We think of our brothers and sisters in the Middle East, specifically in countries like Iran or Turkey, where Christians often lose their lives for the faith that they profess. Think of our brothers and sisters in North Korea, in China, who on this day, the Lord's Day, met in underground circumstances, under fear of being found out, ripped from their families, imprisoned, and perhaps even killed. As we look even in our own country, it begins to become clear that opposition to Christianity and the church are on the rise. As we have just even prayed for our own country this evening. It's easy to see that opposition against the church here even in America is beginning to grow. That the tremendous amounts of privilege we have enjoyed for countless years in this country are seeming to dwindle and opposition is slowly beginning to morph even into persecution. It seems as if the culture around us, and even perhaps the state, doesn't like the church much anymore, and wants to seek to silence it, and to make it go away. And as we are beginning to feel the pressures of these forces, we are beginning to look at ourselves in a new light and say, this is going to be a lot harder than we, think we thought it was going to be originally. As we see the war going out outside of us, it has become commonplace for us to hear phrases like, you're a bigot because you hold to the orthodox teachings of Christianity. The one that is perhaps the most prominent over recent years is we have been warned by the culture not to be on the wrong side of history. This phrase is used almost as a club to say, you better get on the right side here because your team is losing. And the reality is, as Christians, when they are faced with opposition, the cost of their discipleship rises, are often tempted to give in to the pressures that they face. There is a self-preservation instinct within us that says, if we're facing this great opposition, we just need to cave and to give whatever is required. Christians aren't immune from that. When we face opposition, persecution, our heart's temptation is to cave. But here tonight, as we look at our text, continuing in John 15, I want to just simply encourage us, brothers and sisters, that we ought not to worry about whether or not we are on the wrong side of history as the culture would measure it, but rather that we focus and worry about whether or not we are on the right side of God. As we look at our text, I want to look at it in just two parts. First, I want to look at the cost of discipleship in verses 18 through 25. And second, from verses 26 through chapter 16, verse 4, I want to look at our power and our perspective. So begin with me in verse 18, looking at the cost of discipleship. It's important for us to remember our context. We've been in chapter 15 for the previous two weeks now. Last week we saw that Jesus called His disciples to abide in Him. This was a, a positive notion of discipleship, that there's something we should be doing, we should be focusing on communing with Christ, living in His Word. And here Jesus flips the script a little bit and begins to tell the disciples with incredible honesty and clarity that their allegiance to Him will be incredibly costly. That this is not going to be a neutral playing field, that this Christian life is going to be lived on, but rather it's going to be incredibly hostile. In verse 18, he begins by showing us that this is because the world hates us. Verse 18 says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Jesus begins outright by stating that we should not be caught off guard. The disciples should not be surprised if the world turns to hating them because the world hated Jesus Christ. If we were to expound on this verse, Jesus, in many ways, is beginning to prepare His disciples for the moment that is coming later on in the Gospel, which is His crucifixion. And the disciples will behold the hatred of the world towards Christ on full display. And Jesus says, if they crucified me, 
you ought not be surprised if they begin to be hostile towards you. And Jesus gives the reasoning as to why it is that we are hated alongside Christ in verse 19. He says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. It's incredible if you read through the Scriptures and as you read through your Bible reading plans faithfully over this year, you will come to see this tension, this conflict throughout Scriptures that the world we live in is a dark and lost world and God by His grace is reclaiming sinners out of that world for His kingdom. And as we live into that experience, what we begin to see is those who are in the world but not of the world have a very tense experience in this life, we're constantly reminded that we are not at our home. We are constantly reminded that this place is not one where we find true rest, but we only can find true rest in Christ alone. And we live for that city that is to come. And Jesus says, because you've been chosen out of the world, the world looks to you and hates you because you are of Christ. I think of Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 4 where he speaks of the tragedy of the lostness of the world. And he says, of unbelievers, in their case, the God of this world has blinded them from seeing the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When the non-believing world sees Jesus, they don't see Jesus like you see Jesus. And when the non-believing world sees Christians, they don't see Christians the way you see Christians. They are blinded by the God of this world. They cannot see, and therefore they do not know. And so all they see when they see Jesus and when they see you and me is that which they do not like. In fact, Jesus' life and ministry begins and becomes one that is constantly exposing and judging sin. Do you notice how Jesus goes on in this text? He says in verse 22, If I had not come and and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse of their sin. He goes on and says similarly in verse 24, If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my Father. At this point, we need to stop and think, was their guilt something that came about just because Jesus did His ministry? Or is it something else that Jesus is trying to drive after? We know that the sin that is present in the world was still guilty of its sin. That sinners did not become guilty simply when Jesus Christ showed up on the scene. And yet, there's something about the life and ministry of Christ which is exposing the guilt, exposing the sinfulness of man. If we look back at verse 22, he says, If I had not come and spoken, they would not have been guilty, but now they have no excuse for their sin. There's something about the life and ministry of Christ which is revealing the heart of sinners, it's exposing the darkness of their deeds. When Jesus Christ proclaims the gospel, he is proclaiming truth and he is by nature exposing what is false. So brothers and sisters, recognize this. If you are not able, by God's grace and a regenerate heart, to see Christ as glorious and beautiful and good and lovable, when you see Jesus, you see a condemning nature, a condemning message towards sin. And those who love their sin want to dispose of Christ because it is too hard to bear and it's too hard to give up. They are convicted of their sin and that is why they hate Christ. And by nature, they will hate Christians who proclaim Jesus Christ and who hold to Jesus Christ because our lives and ministry will function in many ways the same way. We see that Jesus makes it very clear that this is a consistent feature of the world, but it's not a rational one. If you look at verse 25, he says, the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Jesus wants to make it very clear, even though their actions are actually fulfilling the prophecies of God, they are not rational decisions. They are not justifiable decisions. 
It is not a legitimate position to be in to be in the position of hating God. They hate without cause. And yet Jesus is preparing His disciples and by extension us ourselves for the experience that we will face in the world. Namely, we will be hated because of what Jesus stands for, who He is, and what He has said. I think the verse which perhaps is most helpful here is in verse 20. He says, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus is not holding back any punches here. He is laying out on the table all of the cards so that His disciples can make their uh, accounting decision of whether or not it's going to be worth it to follow Jesus Christ. If you choose to follow Christ, who ended up on a cross, don't be surprised if you also find yourself on one later too. Christian, may I ask you tonight this question, have you taken time to count the cost of following Jesus Christ? Have you taken the time to count the cost of what your faith will inevitably lead you to? Again, we have enjoyed tremendous privilege in our country. As we begin to see changes perhaps happening, it's beginning to awaken us to a, a, a thought, a decision, which our brothers and sisters all over the world have had to think every single day about. We must not sugarcoat the Christian life and otherwise be woefully caught off guard when opposition and persecution come. And brothers and sisters, there are two main ways we can err when we talk about this issue. There are two main ways we can err. First is often what's called theological liberalism or theological progressivism. That is to say, when met with the hatred of the world, we give in to the, the instinct that arises, the temptation which arises for self-preservation. We say, if we can just change up the faith, we can make the world like us. If we just change up what Jesus said and what He did, we can get the world to give us their favor. If we fail to accept the truth that Jesus is teaching in this text and try to seek favor with the world, we will lose our faith and with it the Gospel. We wrongly are told that if we just change some part of the faith, the world will begin to accept us more. Or more subtly, and far more pervasive, even in our own churches and circles, it exists in our own lives as you're sitting across the table from people and you're sharing the Gospel with them, we think if we can just nuance it enough, if we can just get it charitably enough, if we can just be in tune with the culture enough, then they'll like us. Then they'll get it. They'll get on our side. Then we will win over the respect and the admiration of the culture. Wrong, Jesus Christ says in our text. I think Mark Dever absolutely nails it when he says that liberalism often gets into the church usually through the language of evangelism and missions. Both are glorious and important, and both are vital for the Christian life. But how often are we sitting across a table sharing our faith with a non believer, and we so desperately want them to take it? And we feel that pressure of, well, they just have a concern or they have something they want to change, and maybe we can make room, maybe we can try to say, that's okay, you can hold to that belief. Brothers and sisters, we must not give in and a desire to seek the favor of the world that does not have any for Christ or his followers. I'm going to read you an extended quote from one commentary on this text because I think it's incredibly helpful for just nipping this temptation in the bud. He says, The words of Jesus here warn that disciples ought not to presume that they will be able to navigate disputed issues better than Jesus did. They will not be able to produce a more nuanced position that will mollify the world not if they are remaining faithful. They will not be able to be more able than Jesus to finesse the fine points and to make them acceptable to ideological opponents. Jesus is the Master. He is the greatest. They are His servants and not greater than He is. The world rejected the Master. The servants will not succeed in propitiating the world's wrath. Jesus tells His disciples that if they follow Him, the world will treat them as it treated Him. 
The cost of our discipleship is severe. It is real. And the temptation to get rid of the anger of the world must not be given into. We can't out-nuance Jesus or be more favorable than Him. But the other way we can err, and this is very much present in our churches and in our own lives, is we can over-embrace this truth, can't we, Christians? When we find out that the world hates us, we can almost glorify that reality and put on our badge of honor and say, the world hates us, we're going to hate them back. Some are so resolved within this reality to take it on that they begin to play into it more than they should and in ways that God has never called us to. It leads to arrogance and to pride and to more hate. We begin to respond back to hate with hate, which is never a call in the Christian life. We read from Romans 12 tonight. We love our enemies. We pray for them. We extend grace back and we take the cost of what it means to follow Jesus Christ and we do not respond with hate. Brothers and sisters, may I just encourage you, if you are over glorifying this reality and living into this kind of mindset that we are just going to take on the haters and you're responding with arrogance and pride and more hate, may I just encourage you, they might hate you not because you follow Christ, they might just hate you because you're a jerk. We have to be willing to be honest about that. Christ calls us in chapter 15 to say they will hate you because of me, not because of you. We need to remind ourselves of this, that those who we speak to are blinded by the God of this world. Our hearts should break over our enemies. We should desire that they would be saved. And yes, we pray that God would enact His justice, that He would bring vengeance, but we trust that that will either be done on the last day or at the cross in Christ. We need to remember the cost and give ourselves to genuine and mature discipleship. We need to be Christians devoted to prayer. But I want to look at the last section of this Scripture quickly as we look at our power and our perspective. Jesus doesn't just lay out the cards and leave His disciples to flounder, but rather He speaks to where they can put their hope and their encouragement. Verse 26, He begins by saying, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness about Me. Jesus has already spoken of the Spirit already in John chapter 14. He's going to spend John 16 spending more time speaking of the work of the Spirit, but Jesus wants us to know when the hatred of the world crushes in, we are not alone. We have a helper. We have a comforter. We have the Spirit of God residing in our souls and dwelling our hearts. And this helper testifies to the Father. He bears witness about God. And we have to ask this question, why is it important that he's bearing witness of Christ to the disciples when they are being met with the hatred of the world? Well, could it be, brothers and sisters, that when we are in the thick of it, when we are most in opposition and persecution, it is exactly in that time where we need to be reminded of the words of Scripture, of the testimony of Jesus Christ, that we need then to be reminded of the glorious promises that are ours in Christ Jesus to be rooted firmly in the truth of God so that we may endure the persecution we face. Is it not in those moments when we are most cut off from all the privileges we have known, all the comforts we may have been given over to, in those moments we need to be reminded something. That Jesus Christ took on the hatred of the world so that we might be given the love of God. It's in those moments we need our comforter to testify to God Himself. But notice Jesus gives us the comfort as well as the perspective in chapter 16, verses 1-4. through He says, I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. Notice the extreme language He uses in the last three verses. He says, they will put you out of synagogues Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you and thinks he is offering service to God, they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. Brothers and sisters, cancel culture didn't begin just recently. It's been going on since the time of Christ. 
People have not just started to seek to silence Christians and their message. They've been doing it ever since Jesus walked the earth. Jesus is laying out the expectations so that Christians can be aware. Brothers and sisters, now is the time to make peace with the cost of our discipleship, not when it's at your front door. Now is the time to take ready aim and to make a bold declaration that no matter the cost of following Christ, it will never outweigh the reward of following Christ. We need to remind ourselves, brothers and sisters, this world is not our home. The cost will never be greater than the reward. We are here temporarily, and we are here for a reason. But when we find ourselves in the thick of it, we do not become undone. We do not give ourselves over to fear or to confusion. We do not give ourselves over to the demands of this world, but rather we lean on Jesus. When hated by the world, we remind ourselves that we are loved by God. Brothers and sisters, do not worry about being on the wrong side of history as the culture would have you believe it. You will always be on the right side of history if you are on the right side of God. We live for a city that's not made with human hands. Let us help one another to make it till that final day. And may we keep our eyes fixed on Christ, our hope and our Redeemer. Let's pray. God, we thank You that You sent Your Son to experience not only the wrath of this world, but also Your wrath. That we might be those whom You love. God, we pray to help us stand with courage, stand with faith, that we might not waver when it comes to the truth of Christ, but rather we may resolve to follow Christ no matter the cost, because great is the reward for those who have been called out of this world. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.